Good morning, Lipscomb. Um, this morning, um, DA and I have the special privilege of introducing to you um, Dr. Lowry, our president. Uh, we both had the opportunity to spend time with him this summer when we were in London, and while we were there, we learned quite a few things about him that most of you might not know. So right here's, now... Here's the top ten things you may not know about Dr. Lowry. Number one, every Friday morning, he has heated political discussions with Mama Sheila in the cafeteria. Um, number two, he's going as himself for Halloween this year. <laughs> number three, his Little League batting average was 0.0. .0. Um, number four, whenever he sneezes, a parking space disappears. <laughs> number five, his favorite music is southern gospel music. Number six, he's the one who put the soap in the fountain. <laughs> Though this may be hard to believe, he drinks unsweet tea because he's not from the south. Dr. Lowry has three habits, or hobbies. Leather tanning, rescuing stray animals, and achieving his goal of smelling every single Yankee Candle brand. <laughs> and at one point, he really, really wanted to work for the police. Off of that, Dr. Lowry moonlights as Batman. And before you say he doesn't, prove to me that he's not. Someone prove he's not, because I've never seen him in the same room at the same time. In all seriousness, um, most of these things are probably not true. Um, but one thing I do know about Dr. Lowry is that he genuinely cares um, about this university and about this institution, and he has a real heart for the students here, um, and he cares about the successes and failures. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Lowry. Yes. Well, the one thing that was true is my batting average in Little League was zero, zero, zero. As I told the athletes earlier this week, uh, I only played one year of Little League, and uh, even though I never got a hit, and that was a crushing blow to a 12-year-old, uh, I, did, uh, I did get on base. I did get on base regularly. I learned that if you lean far enough over, they would hit you. Uh, and so over and over again, they hit me, and uh, at least I got to, uh, to run around. This is a wonderful time at Lipscomb University, and I'm so thrilled that we get to share this experience together. It's a wonderful time in the development of this university, and you are full partners with us in that development. I want to give you just a little bit of an update on your institution, and then I want to go to a passage of Scripture that is perhaps the second most popular passage in the entire Old Testament and see if I can bring together a short lesson for us this morning. In terms of the university, these are good days. We worked hard all summer to get ready for your return and completed a number of projects that are significant. Let me show you the pictures as we go. You know Bison Square, and we're not done with it yet, but we've made great progress. And uh, I love the fact that you love the fountain uh, and that that is a centerpiece of our campus, and we knew the soap would come eventually. And so now you've done that. That was fun, wasn't it? And uh, now perhaps we can move on, but uh, that is your fountain, that is your square, and we want to make that the centerpiece of this campus. But that's not all that was done. If you're in business, you've seen Stowe Auditorium. Uh, this is just the first piece of redoing the entire swing facility, but this is a centerpiece and a first-class piece and we will dedicate this more formally after the first of the year, but you'll see project after project coming for that facility. But that's not all. Uh, you'll see in the SAC new locker rooms. Those aren't out front, but any of you that use the SAC uh, know that what we had was decrepit and what we now have is first class, and that's for your recreational use. Uh, you know that we've built the new pharmacy research building and now completed on the north part of the campus this entire structure of three buildings, almost $30 million of investment, uh, and that's just the beginning as we move north. Uh, we will be starting sometime after the first of the year, the new science building. Uh, <laughs> that's the scene from Belmont, and if you look at that picture, you'll see right in the middle kind of a square glass area 
that will be a three floor atrium where students will kind of hang out in between the two sides that will have new labs, three floors of them, and then hook into the old McFarland. And when we get this done, then we'll be able to go back into the old McFarland and floor by floor redo it. And then second on the agenda after that is a new civil engineering building. Uh, this will be part of the boulevard that goes from the front of Hughes Center all the way past the academy. Uh, this will roughly be where uh, what's called the Holman House now exists and some metal buildings, all of which look ugly and won't that be an improvement. So that's the next building after that. But let me tell you what else is happening at your university that is important to you as a student. U.S. News just released a lot of information about colleges, and one of the recognitions we got is we are among the top five schools in the Southeast, now hear me carefully, with the least amount of student debt. The least amount of student debt. And I know that if I was in college, mine would be more than our average, 15,000. Uh, but the reality is, students go to Lipscomb University, and that's the average debt they graduate with well, you can see how that compares. Less than the University of Tennessee, less than Middle Tennessee State, less than a lot of our sister institutions because we're working really hard to create great value for you. And that's being recognized as well. The Washington Monthly says we're in the top 12% of colleges nationwide in terms of the value of this education. They call it the bang for your buck. Uh, the Affordable Colleges Online said we are in the top 10% uh, of schools in terms of the investment you make at the beginning and the return you get in your first year salary and your mid-career salary. And all that's to say, not by us, but by other folks, uh, that this university is something worth investing in. Your education is worth investing in, and we are going to continue to work at that so that along with our placement, which is outstanding, you get what you wanted from this institution. A lot of other things going on. 300 or so of you volunteered to help us with the Dove Awards 48 hours ago. And I just wanna thank you all because I know every time we do a major event like this, we disrupt to some degree your life. We're aware of that, and we try very hard not to do that more than we have to, but here's what I want you to understand. We disrupt your life so we can increase the value of your education. There were people that flew from all over the nation for the Dove Awards. We had people at our house for dinner from California and Texas and New York, most of whom had never heard of Lipscomb University. And that disruption that you were so patient with and endured and all of you that helped us now will result in the Dove Awards being broadcast on the 20th of October on a cable network that goes to 67 million homes. And so if you could look beyond the inconvenience of the moment and say, okay, there's a reason they're doing it. And the reason is to increase the value of the degree I will get from this institution. Thank you for being so patient with us. We could talk on and on and on about things that are going on at Lipscomb, but let me just say to you, uh, it's a good place to be, and we're all working hard to make it that. But beyond the buildings, beyond the programs, beyond the accreditation, beyond the special events, is something even more significant. And that is the work we're doing to develop the character of students who are here. We talk about competence and we do a good job of that. You're going to be competent as you move into your field. But we also talk a lot about character. And a lot of schools are silent when it comes to that. The president of Princeton said not long ago, you know, our job is to educate students. It's their job to figure out character. And we just don't believe that. We think the two are really intertwined uh, and that long after you figure, finish this experience, your character is going to define who you are and the life that you lead. So let's go back 2,700 years. And in going back 2,700 years, let's open ourselves to a particular story. 
You know, the Old Testament is largely about the relationship of God and his children, the children of Israel. And this relationship at times was very, very good and at times was really, really challenged. And here's one of those moments where prosperity had been with the people of Israel. Uh, They had been given all kinds of things, saved from slavery in Egypt. Their lives were good and their response was to abandon the very God who gave that to them. And so we peek in to this moment in time And the people of Israel are no longer the God-fearing, God-worshipping people. Uh, The judges were immoral and the people were immoral. And they they were not in relationship with those who had great need in their community. They were ignoring uh, those who were poor and those who were widows and those who were orphans. Uh, And God's getting kind of irritated at this. And so he does what he often does. He sent a prophet. Now, now we don't have prophets today, so I don't know exactly how to describe someone like Micah. But Micah's job was to go into the lives of these people and to essentially be the voice of God. And so there's this moment in the sixth chapter of Micah where we have a rather different scene. The scene is something I'd be familiar with because I'm a lawyer, not a theologian. It's a scene of a courtroom, and and God is kind of irritated, and he's going to charge his people with their transgressions, their sin, uh, their sense of not being in relationship. And so we have these words, and you have to imagine the scene. Here is God that is the plaintiff in this case, bringing the charges. Here is God, the prosecutor, the one declaring what's wrong. And he has these words according to Micah. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains, the Lord's accusations. Listen, you everlasting foundation of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. That's got to be a pretty fundamentally scary moment. Here the Lord is saying, get ready, here's my charge against my people. And yes, he does that. He does that not with the oratory of what you might think of as a television lawyer. He does it with the tenderness and the compassion of a father. And instead of yelling and screaming when it comes to the accusation, he asks some questions. And you all in your relationship with your parents have been in this moment. You've been in the moment where you messed it up and you were expecting the harshness of a parent and all of a sudden you might have gotten something different. And so here's the Lord with the tenderness of someone who has great love for his people and he says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. And then he goes on to say, you know, didn't I bring you out of the slavery of Egypt? Didn't I protect you in this moment? Didn't I send these people to help you? Help me understand why in response to all of that would you act like this? And so we have no rebuttal. The defense never gets to make a statement. There is no sense of saying your facts are wrong, you don't understand the law, we're not guilty. The people of Israel know they are. And so they start doing something kind of interesting. They start trying to negotiate with God. Now, I taught negotiation for 19 years. That's my academic field. I know a little bit about the communication process, the back and forth when you're trying to persuade someone. And so here are the people of Israel, and they're not really very sincere. They're almost sarcastic. They say, well, okay, Lord, what do you want? What do you want us to bring? You want a burnt offering? Okay, we know how to do sacrifice. Will that satisfy you? Or, Lord, maybe you want our calves, our very best of the litter. You want us to bring them to you? Or maybe, Lord, 
you want 10,000 rams. I don't know how they'd wind up getting 10,000 rams, but, but maybe they were willing to try. Do you want 10,000, 1,000, 5,000? What would you like? Or how about rivers of oil? We'll gather it up, the precious thing that is part of our sustenance, and we'll give it to you. Or how about this, God? How about our firstborn? Is that what you want? Is that going to buy you off? They missed it. Because God didn't want any of those things. God's not willing to negotiate. God's not willing to say, go ahead and buy me off and it'll be okay. God has something far more profound for them. And here we have the moment where Micah comes in and helps us understand with a question that is the most famous question probably in the entire Old Testament. And he says, what does the Lord require of you? The Lord requires of you to, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's a completely different agenda. And I think if we pull all that together and try to look through it, what he's really saying is, look, you can try to buy me off with all the stuff you want to offer, and I'm not really very interested. You're talented. I'm glad you're talented. You'll set records. I'm glad you set records. You're going to make a lot of money. Make a lot of money. You're going to be really successful. Be really successful. But listen carefully. None of that's what I had in mind for the people who follow me. For the people who follow me, I want you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Now, there have been times in my life I tried to negotiate with God. One of them was in Yosemite when I was a high school student. And here I am that first day hiking up through the place where Half Dome is, uh, several thousand feet. We were going to be gone for nine days. We we're going to hike 72 miles on the John Muir Trail. We got out of the base camp that day. We spent all day hiking, 12, 14 hours. We were behind in getting started. And then about 9 or 10 o'clock that night, we begin to see the clouds come. This is August in Yosemite. We didn't have rain gear. We didn't have snow gear. And by 10 or 11 o'clock that night, here are eight young men huddled around a fire. It's snowing. It's getting colder and colder. And we have no way even to find a trail to hike out. And so there we are all through the night trying to keep a fire alive and wondering how in the world, in the middle of Yosemite, do we find a way out? We're absolutely cold, we're absolutely wet, and that's one of those moments where you try to negotiate with God. Okay, God, here we are, we're a mess. What does it take? Okay, I promise to always go to church on Wednesday night. Is that enough? Will you find the way out for us if I promise to always go to church on Wednesday night? What if I decide I'm going to give you a lot of what I have? Will that work? And all of a sudden we realize we're not going to negotiate that way. Much closer to this campus are the moments that I've had to go to Vanderbilt and have an MRI. I hate that machine. Any of you who have been in one know that if you've got the least bit of claustrophobia, that tube is around you and they put the earphones on and you hear the clanking of the machine and you're tied down and you can't move and I try to negotiate with God. Just get me through this, God. Even if you find something bad, I'll try to survive it, but get me through it. I can't stand even the test. God says, hold on a second. That's not how I'm involved in your life. The way I'm involved in your life is if you choose to answer the question and walk out a life of justice and of mercy and walking humbly with me. And so let's talk about each of those for just a half a second. We think about justice. What's a good definition for justice? I like this one. Justice is when we engage on behalf of those who lack power. When we engage on behalf of those who, in our culture, in our society, simply lack power. One of the great places that you folks minister in such a wonderful way is in our program at the Tennessee Prison for Women. 
And for those of you who have been there, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that haven't, sign up for that class. I guarantee it will change your life. Because every week you'll be sitting there with a dozen Lipscomb students and there'll be a dozen inmates, many of whom are going to spend the rest of their life in that prison. And you'll be studying the same thing. And you as a Lipscomb student will have to work really hard because almost every semester the inmates do better with their GPA than you do with yours. Now now they have more time to study. Uh, They don't have some of the distractions you have but we find they're bright folks. And the lesson you'll get from that as you seek to engage with those who have no power is that in some ways their lives, they're not all that different than yours. Well, they are in terms of their daily life, but they're not. You'll come back and say, you know, but for a bad night, a bad choice, a bad decision, that could kind of be me. And that's the way it is. And I so appreciate the fact that you express justice by engaging with them. And when I was there two or three weeks ago, I said, tell me about this. And over and over again, they said, one of the most remarkable things about this program is that Lipscomb students who don't have to be here come in every single week. They're our light to the world. And they treat us with such respect. Thank you for acting justly. Michael also says there's something about mercy, mercy in the sense of kindness, mercy in the sense of a loving relationship. I like to define it this way. It's an authentic investment in the lives of others. You've got to love people at some level to invest in their lives. And again, you folks are tremendous. We had a business breakfast in here this morning. We had 500 business leaders from Nashville. And I told them about things that had happened in this arena in the last two or three weeks. And one of the things I mentioned was that moment where we we invited you to help the contributor and the homeless in Nashville. And I told them honestly, I thought when I gave you that challenge that I'd match every dollar you gave, you'd come up with three or four or five hundred. You came up with almost six thousand dollars. And this group of 500 business leaders When they heard the story, the applause was not for me. It was for the students at Lipscomb who understand something about mercy, something about loving people, something about being kind to them. And you're going to have another opportunity in January to do that. We have not announced publicly yet, but we've received a grant from the state of Tennessee. And we're going to do most, some, one of the most amazing things I've heard about. We are going to invite onto this campus to be colleagues of yours, young men and young women who are intellectually challenged. These are folks that would never qualify to go to college in the normal sense. But one of the things we've learned is that if they can have something of a college experience, That will change their lives forever. They won't get a degree from this university, but some will be in your classes. And you could look over there and say, in some kind of sarcastic and inappropriate way, she's retarded. Or you could say, I have an opportunity to demonstrate kindness to someone whose life will forever be different because I could share a little tiny bit of this college experience. And we can accept that grant from the state and we can be confident because we know who you are and how you will share your life. Finally, it says, walk humbly with your God. I don't know what humility always is, but it's something about seeing yourself as God sees you. You know, the reality is we want to follow our plan, but humility says, no, God, It's your plan we're searching for. There's something about saying, no, I'm going to be independent. And humility says, no, I'm always going to be dependent. There's something about saying, okay, I put together life and all these pieces. I can have a certain confidence. I can have a certain arrogance. And yet God says, hold on just a second. I'm not after your arrogance. I'm after your humility. 
And if you pull all that together, the message I want you to leave with this morning is a message of answering that question. What does the Lord require of you? It's those three things, and you can easily remember them. Act justly, love mercy, and walk kindly, humbly with your God. Now, how do we do it? Well, you will have opportunities different than mine, and I've had opportunities different than yours. And I want to close with just one moment where God allowed me, I think, to reflect those values in my life. Before I became a college president nine years ago, uh, I was teaching at the law school at Pepperdine, but I had another career, and that's not one we've talked about very much. I was a professional mediator. Now, you know what that really means is when lawyers got stuck with a case and they couldn't figure out how to resolve it, they'd call me. And so I would laugh at times and say, no one ever calls when things are going well. And if that was a government in Africa, if that was a department in our federal government, if that was a major corporation, whatever it was, when the call came, I knew they were having trouble getting something resolved. And my work was to be a mediator. My ministry was all. And so as I sought to walk that out, had just a number of amazing moments, I just want to end this morning by telling you one of them. I was called to Boise, Idaho, and I walked into a hotel room, and there in the hotel room were about a dozen lawyers and business people. And they were there because of a dispute. The dispute had to do with a 62-year-old woman. She'd worked for this company for about 30 years. She'd never had a bad evaluation. But at 62, they fired her and a lot of other older women. And so her lawyers had brought this case that really had to do with wrongful termination and age discrimination, all this legal stuff. But at the core, it was whether or not this company had been fair. And so here we are, and we tell the story. And the plaintiff over here says, you know, here's what's wrong. Here's what the company did wrong. Here's what the jury's going to do. And the defense says, no, it didn't happen that way. Those facts aren't right. The jury will never do that. And there's this big argument among the lawyers. But eventually, I get to say something. And when they all calm down after an hour or so of those courtroom moments, I get to ask a question and the person I want to ask are not the lawyers. The person I want to talk to is the woman, the woman sitting here in a chair. Now, now you've got to kind of understand this scene. Uh, here she is in a room full of male lawyers. Here she is trying to figure out what to do, and, and she has this purse, and I'm going to borrow yours if I can. Uh, she's sitting here in this chair, just as nervous as she can be. And she's sitting here with her legs crossed and she's sitting holding this purse. Twelve lawyers in the room and she's holding on to the only thing she's got left. And I'm not a psychologist, but you can read this situation. Her legs are crossed, her arms are crossed, she's holding on to her purse. And I know when I start talking to her, I'm going to have to be really, really careful. So I looked over at her and I said, can you tell me well, can you tell me, well, your lawyers have done a good job of presenting this case, but, but what do you want? And there she is with her arms folded, her legs crossed, holding onto this purse. And she says, almost under her breath, she says, all I want is what I would have had. What's that? I don't really know. I said, what do you mean? All you want is what you would have had. You've got lawyers who filed a lawsuit. We're going to be in trial in 10 weeks. And here she's saying, all I want is what I would have had. I said, what's that? She said, well, if they would have just let me work for a couple more years, I could have retired. And when I retired, I'd have medical benefits for the rest of my life. But they fired me, and I don't get those. My sense is I really didn't have the whole story. And so I said, well, tell me more. She said, well, if you understood my situation, you would know. And I said, well, I'm not from here. I don't understand your situation. Tell me. And she continued. 
in this soft, quiet voice. She said, if they just let me work for two more years, I could have retired. I would have had medical benefits for the rest of my life. I said, why are those so important? And she said, well, if you knew my story, you'd know. I said, tell me your story. And through the frailness of her voice and the quiet of the moment, she said, well, she said, I, I really need those medical benefits. And I said, why? She said, well, she said, you need to understand, my son, who's an adult, and well, he has polio, and I'm his sole source of support. And my daughter, she's an adult as well, and she has MS, a terminal neurological disease. And my husband, well, well, he can't work anymore either because he has cancer. I really need those medical benefits. And it was absolutely quiet in that room full of lawyers. Because see, for the first time, they understand what their own case is about. It's not about some precedent of the Idaho Supreme Court. It's about a 62-year-old woman where justice has not been done, where mercy has not been shown. And we have the chance to do that. It's about our medical benefits. Well, I dismissed her. I said, why don't you go out and sit in the lobby for a couple of moments? Let me talk to your lawyers. She leaves. The lawyer's in the room. I said, look, I'm just the new guy here. But it seems to me that if you solve the problem with your medical benefits, you resolve the case. One lawyer slammed his hand down and said, look, if you're telling me to pay $287,000, you can forget it. I said, hold on, I'm not telling you anything. I'm just saying if you solve the problem. And pretty soon another lawyer said, well, you know, the problem here, the problem is that if she was retired, she'd be on the retiree medical plan. She'd have these benefits all the rest of her life. But she was fired. She wasn't retired. I said, really? And she told us she'd worked for 30 years. She'd never had a bad evaluation. But she also said, I worked for 30 years and the top money I ever made was $17,000 a year. And so we started working on it. And a couple of hours later, we brought the executive vice president back in, brought her back in. He said to her, he said, Mrs. So-and-so, he said, we think we've heard what you're talking about today, and I want to make you an offer. He said, the first thing we want to do is, well, we want to give you a check tomorrow because we know you've been off for about a year and that's been very, very difficult. The company will give you a check for that year. Next thing we want to do, this may seem surprising, we want to re-employ you and we're going to re-employ you uh, for a couple of years uh, until you can retire. When you retire, we're going to give you all your benefits. And he said, of course, during that two years, we're going to give you your salary and we're going to give you the benefits you would normally get. You don't have to worry about that. But we want to offer something else. We want to give you the choice as to whether or not you ever come back to work. Because if what you want to do is stay home and take care of your family, it's fine with us. It's fine with us. And there she sat. In the moment where justice was done, and mercy was shown. There she sat in a moment where she had something she never imagined. She had something no court in America could give her. She had the opportunity to stay home and take care of her family. No court could provide that fast enough for them to still be alive. And yet in this moment, where perhaps we walked out a little bit of this passage, we were able to have that impact. If you leave this university with all the competence in the world, with all the success that those organizations say you'll have, if you leave with all the records that have been set and all the confidence in the world, and you don't leave answering this question right, we will have failed. But if you leave answering this question like, like you already do, like you did two weeks ago with a contributor, like you do on mission trips, like you do over and over again, when you answer this question right, then I can go to bed at night and say, God, I think we're doing it well. We're producing people with competence. 
But we're producing people who can answer this question. And as the light into the world they go, they will be acting justly. They will be showing mercy and kindness. And as they do that, they'll be walking humbly with you. And God bless you. Thank you for being a part of this journey.